So let us look a little bit at some results from number theory. None of them very deep and most of them quite straightforward. And all of them we can actually nicely illustrate by examples. And the first example will just complete our discussion of period finding. And there I'm going to introduce continued fractions. This involves division with remainder and therefore modular arithmetics, which will also appear in our problem of order finding. And this order finding will then help us to tackle the problem of prime factorization. So we are going to explain this connection. And to verify that this is then really efficient, we will also need some very simple statements about greatest common divisors and the Euclidean algorithm. The theory of continued fractions is very rich, but we will only need the main idea, which is that we can systematically construct rational approximations of real numbers x including for the case that these numbers are rational numbers themselves, by the following repeated application of steps. We first split off the integer part of x, and so this then leaves a remainder, which we rewrite by putting it as its inverse into the denominator. And now we treat this denominator as we did in our first step by taking its integer part. And so there we have another remainder, call it r prime, and this we will write in the same way. And then we take its integer part, and there we have another remainder, which we will write in the same way. And we just continue like this. So always taking integer parts and taking remainders that we put into the denominator as described. And this rapidly gives you very accurate approximations of this number x. For illustration, consider the case that we carried out the period finding algorithm with 8 quantum bits and our measurement of x tells us that n over r must be close to 43 divided by 256. Then we can use continued fractions to find other rational numbers that are close to this. And for this, we first take the integer part of what we have here. Well, in this case, this is just 0. And then we take the remainder, but we put it into the denominator. Next, we again take the integer part of this, which equals to 5, and take the remainder, which is 41 divided by 43, but we put it again into the denominator. Now the integer part is just 1, and so we continue with this, where the remainder is now 2 divided by 41, but we put it again into the denominator. And now here we have 20, and then we just have 1 half. Well, this is already an integer itself, so we can just take its integer part, but then we have nothing that remains, and therefore we stop here. And this will always happen for rational numbers. At some point, this terminates. And then this is an exact expression as given here. But we can also use this to obtain other rational numbers which are close to this. And for this, we are just neglecting some of these parts, so we just stop a little bit early, for instance, at this point here. And when we then add everything up, we don't get a number which is identical, but just close to this. And in this case, indeed, 21 divided by 125. So this gives us now two candidates for n and r, namely these two numbers here. These could also be multiples of these numbers, because these multiples could just cancel out. But we can also obtain some further candidates, for instance, when you stop here, because this then gives us 1 over 6. So 6 would be another candidate for the period. And then we can return to our function and see which of these candidates indeed works out. So this tool from number theory really completes our discussion of period finding. We have now everything together to extract information about the period little r in a very efficient way. 
Furthermore, the very same tool we are later going to reutilize when we come to order finding and prime factorization. These, however, are problems which are based firmly in number theory itself, so we continue with our preparations and now turn to modular arithmetics. And we will again just need some very basic aspects, and we indeed encountered these already above, for instance, when we determined the integer part of this fraction here. Because essentially we split this into two parts, where one of the two numbers really divides the other one, and then we have essentially the remainder, which is this part here. So this is just 5, and here we have something which is related to the remainder of the division of 256 by 43. And now we are going to write this in the following form. We write 256 modulo 43 equals 41. Just to give you another example, we could also look at the following fraction and write this in this form here. And again, what we have here is the remainder of this division. So we would write this as this expression here. And in general, we just write this as a mod m where a and m are some integers and this remainder we are going to call d so that it will not clash with some other symbols and we will always agree that d ranges from 0 to m minus 1 so it's less than m. So it could for instance also be 0 and that's for instance the case when we take 330 modulo 11 so then we obtain this result here. In all these cases this is most straightforwardly interpreted is the statement that a can be written as an integer multiple of m plus d, where d is constrained in this way. And this has always a unique solution. This defines modular arithmetic, so let's have a look what are some interesting features of this. And we will look at two, and the first one is just for illustration. Let us say we are interested in a certain number a, and what we know about it is that modulo 5, it is equal to 3, and modulo 7, it is equal to 2. And now the question is, what is a modulo 35, which is really the product of 5 and 7? And then there is an ancient theorem known as the Chinese remainder theorem that tells us that there's a unique solution to this. And this we can indeed determine quite efficiently by first listing all the numbers from the first condition, which are less than 35. So that would be 3, 8, 13, 18, 23, 28, and 33. And recognize that there are exactly 7 of these. And then look at these modulo 7. So this would be 3, 1, 6, 4, and indeed 2 here. And here we have 0. And then we have 5. And you see that all the numbers between 0 and 6, all possible remainders, indeed appear here. And this is because we fulfilled a central condition of the Chinese remainder theorem, namely that these numbers here, 5 and 7, do not have any common prime factors. Well, in this case, they are both primes themselves and distinct. But this condition suggests that there is an interesting relation between modular arithmetics and finding the prime factors of numbers. And to understand this, we now turn to our second interesting feature, which is known as order finding. This is defined in terms of the following equation in modular arithmetics, where we have numbers a and m again, but now we also consider all powers of a, and we are looking for the smallest positive power, so that this gives us 1. This value of r, so the smallest positive value for which this is true, is known as the order of this equation. It is actually not so difficult to see how this relates to prime factorization, but let me first illustrate what we do here by an example. Actually 2, so let's consider the following equations of taking 5 modulo 7 and then taking powers of 5, and the same with 13. 
So here I list the values of r and I will indeed start with 0 even though this is not a positive value but this will highlight the aspect of periodicity in here. And down here I'm going to write down the results making use of modular arithmetics and we start with 1. And that's because 5 to the power 0 is just 1 and this will always be the remainder of these divisions. And then we are successively multiplying by 5 so we obtain 5 here and because this is less than 7 and 13 we just leave it there. Then we go to the second power that's 25 but modulo 7 this is actually 4 and we write it like this with this sign here and modulo 13 this is actually 12. And now we can just multiply 4 by 5 and obtain 20 which modulo 7 is 6 and here we obtain 60 which modulo 13 is 8. Now we come to 30 which modulo 7 is 2 and here we have 8 times 5 that's 40 modulo 13 is actually 1 so for this equation the order is actually 4. But for the first equation we still need to continue and so we obtain 2 times 5 equals to 10 which is the same as 3 modulo 7 and then we obtain 15 which modulo 7 is indeed 1. So here the order is 6. So these are our results and utilizing modular arithmetics in the steps in between they were not that difficult to obtain. But this is actually only because we were dealing with very small numbers. When one carries this out with very large numbers, in particular for m, then one finds that this becomes very time consuming and indeed as complex as finding the prime factors of m itself. And this can be seen in the following way. When we start out with this equation here, as given above, then we can also rewrite it in this form here. And now let us assume that r is even. And indeed, 2 times some value of r prime. And then we can write this also in the following form. So in terms of two factors, which are both integers, and we obtain the following result. Let us further assume that m is made out of two prime factors, p and q. And that then means that these prime factors also need to appear somewhere here, because this tells us that this number here is a multiple of p times q. And for instance, one factor could appear here, and the other one could appear here. In there, they might then still be multiplied by other factors, for instance, some n1 here, and some n2 here. So this is one way this could break down. But what we have achieved in this way is that we have constructed some new numbers such as this number here which share some prime factors with m. And generally this will indeed be their greatest common divisor. But once one has two numbers which share a common divisor one can determine this common divisor very efficiently by what is known as a Euclidean algorithm. I will introduce this in a minute but to make it relevant to prime number factorization, I'm going to add one further example down here, where m is indeed the product of two prime numbers. And I just give you the results here, which can again be obtained by applying modular arithmetics as before. And this tells us that the order here is again 6. So this gives us now two candidate numbers in here. Half of the order is 3, so we have the third power of 11 minus 1 and the third power of 11 plus 1. And this turns out to be 1330 as well as 1332. And then we want to determine a common divisor and indeed the greatest common divisor of these numbers and m. And for this we are going to use the Euclidean algorithm. according to which the greatest common divisor of two numbers, let's call them c and d, and we assume that d is a smaller one, can be replaced by this expression here, where we just take c modulo d. 
So this gives us a smaller number. And when one iterates this a number of times, then this rapidly converges to the greatest common divisor. Let's see how this works for example. So we look at our first candidate number and try to find the greatest common divisor with m, which is 21, and then replace it with this expression here. Well, this turns out to be 7. And then we see straight away that our greatest common divisor is 7. Let's have a look at our second candidate number, well in our second step the result that we obtained for 7 should just be twice larger now because we have added 2 so this is 9 and there we could read off our greatest common divisor already but let's just introduce one more step for illustration so we have 21 modulo 9 which turns out to be 3 and therefore the greatest common divisor here is 3 and altogether we have indeed determined the two prime factors of 21. The Euclidean algorithm remains very efficient even with very large numbers and this tells you that prime number factorization and order finding have really the same level of complexity. So let us turn to our next step then and see how order finding can be implemented on a quantum computer.